everyone, and welcome back to those who joined our first session earlier on today, where we discussed the importance of building high performance and resilient networks. In case you missed it, Nokia CEO Pekka Lundmark talked about what people want from CSPs and how despite challenges in growing customer revenues, with investments in new technologies, they can address new markets. Also, our friendly hacker Karen Elizari discussed security strategies to address the growing threat surface as the number of IoT connections increase. And we also heard from Chris Dancy, the world's most connected person, about how networks are making us more human, not less, and that we should not unplug, but instead embrace our world of connectivity. Our first session certainly generated some dialogue across all of the platforms, so please keep your comments coming. Now coming up in this next session, we're gonna talk about unlocking business potential. From powering new experiences in retail and gaming to enabling the fourth industrial revolution, 5G will be a key enabler for these sectors and many more. But just how do CSPs position themselves for growth? Josh Ariner is the Vice President of Communications Service Provider Marketing at Nokia and he's going to present the five key principles from technology leaders that enable them to take their organizations to the next level and unlock business potential. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Josh Ariner, Vice President of CSP Marketing at Nokia. Like many of you joining us today, I too am thinking about the future of our industry. The pace of change and the scale of disruption is unlike anything we've seen before, and we know it will only intensify. It's more important than ever that we carve out time to consider how we'll cope with this change as it presents both a threat as well as an incredible opportunity. I hope today's Real Talk speakers give you some interesting insights and perspectives to consider as we take this industry into the future. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to share the principles guiding innovation as we as an industry adapt to accelerated disruption and digitalization. I'll preface that by saying I'm an optimist, passionate about technology and its potential to solve the big problems we face in our world, passionate about people and their potential to innovate, and passionate about the underlying importance of the telecom industry in our communities, industry, and society at large. Ready or not, disruption is coming. Disruption is all around us, be it 5G, new competitors or revolutionary business models, and of course now, COVID-19. Now while 5G and new competitors are things we have talked about for a while, obviously no one could have seen COVID-19 coming, but there's little doubt that the disruption that has happened as a result will be felt for some time. The rapid shift to working from home, visiting doctors or clients by video conference, or even attending virtual events just like this one, have now become the norm. The pandemic has accelerated our digital agendas much faster than Moore's Law. We must embrace digital transformation and lead it at an exponential pace or it will leave us behind. So how do we tap into the opportunity this disruption creates and unlock business potential? That's the question. With technology changing so quickly, the answer lies more in how we approach change. What I and several other large organizations that study change for a living have found is that companies and people that come out the other side have five things in common. One, a growth mindset, not just focused on protecting the past, but leveraging the best of technology and innovation to drive forward. It also means that you don't need to do it alone, but you can build an ecosystem to help drive this growth. They always look for better. They always look for new ways to grow. And this is an important mentality. Second, technology has to be a core business driver. You must invest in technology to improve just about every aspect of the business, be it cloud, automation, AI, or human-centric design, openness, Disruptors understand the power of technology and use it to their advantage. This is crucial in the digital world. Third, we must have a relentless focus on our customers. The best companies spend the bulk of their time understanding what their customers need now and anticipating what they will need later. 
Now is the time to reinvent our relationships with our customers. Their needs have shifted as a result of disruption too. So we have to help to give them an extraordinary experience in whatever we do. Fourth, we all must prioritize speed and agility. This is a critical area. You need to be more agile to meet changing environments. COVID-19 has taught us all of this, if nothing else. But this is hard to do when the speedometer is constantly accelerating. You need to be obsessed with making it easier for customers to consume innovation faster. Software created for business environments must be as simple to use as the applications on our handsets. Five, intelligence driven is everywhere. The best companies are data driven, as we know. A lot of opportunities for new AI and machine learning applications are ahead of us. We at Nokia are investing in these. We're working with our customers, governments, and others to find ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19 along with a host of other use cases. Are you ready to unlock business potential? These five principles are ones that we must anchor to as we look forward. These are the ones that have been proven to be most important for companies striving to capitalize on the potential that disruption affords. I hope these ideas and some of the others you will hear today are things you can take into your business and unlock new opportunities. And as the optimist, I'm excited to see what we can do. Our industry serves an important role in the world, now more than ever. We are not done innovating or changing, and we are only just beginning. Thank you, Josh. Next up, world-renowned digital anthropologist and best-selling author, Brian Solis, explores the true meaning of innovation in times when everything seems to really not make too much sense. Based on his years of research in challenging convention and breaking new ground, he will share insights on why we shouldn't look at this as the new normal or even the next normal, but instead how we need to look further ahead to plot a new and better path forward. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. I am so excited to be part of Nokia's Real Talk. And that's just what we're gonna do. We're gonna kick off everything with some real talk here. Before we can move forward, we actually have to take a step back to appreciate where we are in the present, even though these are disruptive times before we move forward. See, I can't call these times the new normal, nor can I think the, about the future as the next normal. I think normal, was part of the problem to begin with. And I think striving for mediocrity or settling for mediocrity is not okay in a time of both great disruption and also great opportunity for innovation. Let's talk about that word, innovation. I think often when companies look at their innovative strategies or when they talk about becoming innovative or when they invest in technologies or new opportunities or new solutions that may seem innovative because it's new to them. It's not really innovative to the industry or more importantly to the customer or the customer's customer. Oftentimes when we look at, for example, 5G on the horizon, we think about things much more iteratively but confuse it with iteration, but there's a real difference. It's not that iteration is bad, it's just different, right? Iteration is doing the same things, investing in new technologies to improve efficiencies, to scale, uh, to do things better. Innovation, however, is creating new value or unlocking new value. And I see the, the combination of both of those things will lead to disruption, which is, or could lead to disruption, I should say, which is making, doing these new things that make the old things obsolete. So for example, there's a famous quote about the light bulb was not invented from the continuous improvement or iteration of candles. At some point, it just had to jump the curve, as they say, to the next thing. And that's what I want to talk to you about, because that is real talk. We've got 5G coming. 
we have all kinds of incredible technologies, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, if we want to call it that. Uh, we have, uh, <laughs> I'm talking about quantum so much, and it's so it's it's so far yet so close. Uh, but we have, I think there's 30 different technologies all sort of looming around out there with AI and uh, autonomous vehicles and robotics. Uh, I, essentially this fourth industrial revolution. But I want to get my arms around it with you here today. We are not in a new normal or the next normal. We are not striving for iteration. iteration. We're striving for iteration and innovation. So I call these times the novel economy, and I want us to be prepared for how we think about this future, how we rethink or reimagine this fourth industrial revolution for a new opportunity for us, for our partners, for our customers and their customers. I call these times the novel economy. And the novel economy is essentially inspired by the novel coronavirus, because like the novel coronavirus, novel itself just simply means new and unusual. These times are without precedent, but more importantly, they're without a vaccine uh, for businesses alike. Uh, they are without a playbook, and they are without a checklist or case studies that we can just follow forward. The novel economy starts with surviving. Let's figure out business continuity. Let's help our partners figure out business continuity. The next phase is alive. Let's figure out how not to just adjust for this new normal, but to think about the next economy so that we're gaining the skill sets, we're thinking about the new solutions, the disruptions, so that we can invest in technologies and solutions and operational innovation and digital business model innovation so that we raise the bar, so that we change the game for phase three, which is Thrive. That's a post-COVID world where we are innovating our way forward, unlocking new value, rethinking business models and operational models because that's where we're headed. There is, otherwise everybody else is just heading for this new normal and this next normal, but we're better than that. We've got so many exciting things happening right now. So beyond connectivity revenue, 5G is gonna need its killer apps for both consumers and also businesses, right? So there's a coming wave of hype. <laughs> what am I talking about? We're already diluged in hype. But there's also the potential for disillusionment. And that means that we don't want to lose any luster in terms of possibilities. We want to reimagine how to generate that killer app or those killer apps for consumers and also businesses alike, and also enterprise partners and technology vendors that we can partner with as well. So on the consumer side of things, we have to consider, well, what are our partnerships to deliver innovative consumer services or consumer experiences? Customer experiences are more important than ever before. In fact, uh, Salesforce just released its State of the Connected Customer Report, and in it, it says both business customers and also consumers, 80% of them combined, said that experiences are as or more important than the products or services you sell. So let me give you an example. Last year, at this time, actually, it was Thanksgiving Day, now that I think about it. I was invited to the Chainsmokers con concert in San Francisco, where they were going to reveal a 5G activation that was special just for that audience. The 5G was actually deployed within the Chase Arena. And during a particular song, I think it was called Can I Call You Mine, they unlocked or unleashed this 5G activation, this augmented reality solution. As you were holding your phone up, you were actually able to see there, they have this digital mascot that sort of tours with them. As they were playing, this mascot is singing along with them, and it sort of brought to life a whole new dimension. Was it the killer app? No, but it was definitely uh, a glimpse of possibility. And I think that's where I want to focus us today, is this possibility, the art of the possible. See, we don't know the future solutions today. This is why there's so much hype around 5G. Well, what are the killer apps? Well, let's, let's start to figure those out. I actually believe that in these times, we need to think more like Disney. We need to think more like secret cinema out of the UK that kind of converges this Broadway-like and movie-like cinema experience where you're part of the storyline. 
or The Void, uh, which was born out of Utah, which is essentially an immersive uh, video game experiment where you are walking around wearing gear, haptic gear, virtual reality goggles, where you and your team are in a game or in a movie and you experience it and you feel it. We need to think like game designers to move forward because essentially you can unlock retail, you can unlock real world experiences, not just with 5G, but with exciting new partnerships that can create worlds that we didn't imagine or couldn't imagine or couldn't even activate until today. See, every time we hold up one of these devices or whatever the next device is, we are looking into windows or through windows into new worlds. And those worlds, those platforms and services, they need, as Disney would call it, imagineering. We need to imagine what tomorrow looks like, but build for it today. So for example, we need to create experience stores or experience centers where consumers and business customers can come in to experience what tomorrow is like today, because that's the thing. We don't know what we don't know. Magic has to come to life like we might see at Disney World or Disneyland. And that is all about Imagineering is to sort of invent the impossible to make it possible. That's what I love about these times so much. So for example, if you think about an innovation center. I don't mean just to kind of showcase all of the shiny objects, but actually to demonstrate the possibilities as an artist or as a creative or as an innovator. Because if you think about it, Sir Ken Robinson talks about creativity being an important or actually more important than literacy. I don't know that it's more important, but it's definitely important. And his whole argument was that we sort of taught creativity out of children to prepare them for the real world, to put them in these linear processes and these hierarchical structures. But essentially, though, creativity is more important now than ever. We need to imagine things that don't exist today. And we weren't trained to be creative or innovative in the roles that we're in today. Yet that's exactly how we have to think as a technologist, as a designer, as a programmer, as a strategist, as an executive. So let's break this down. We talked about consumer. Now let's talk about enterprise. Enterprise too needs to see an experience center. Right? If they can't imagine the future, well, someone's got to help them imagine that. Somebody's got to help them imagineer that way forward. That's, I think, why we're here together. That's our real talk. Because pan the pandemic accelerated digital transformation. And some estimates, the roadmaps that were 10 years out, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mixed reality, automation in terms of RPA. I mean, these are things that are fast forwarding to today. Right? This is phase one of the novel economy. This is stuff that we're doing right now that was 10 years out because we had to do it. We had to make incredible shifts. And now that we saw that we can do the impossible, now the whole world is our oyster. What can we possibly do next? Well, we know that we have IoT, we have IIoT, we have sensors, we have edge, we have 5G. So what can we give what machines what processes can we give a voice to to send that voice in terms of data back to interpret to analyze to find patterns to maybe eventually make decisions where machines are doing that on our behalf and we're freed to think about new creative solutions of what else we can do with t technology like the conductors of an orchestra These are new possibilities that have to be imagined and they have to be built into sophisticated, integrated, and even, gosh, I mean, customer service solutions and products. I guess that's the best way to put it is that people on the buy side, whether that's your business customer or that's your enterprise customer or that's your consumer, they just need a little help in seeing what they need, but don't know they need, 
And once they have it, they can't live without it. That's what Walt Disney was so good at. That's what Steve Jobs was so good at. That's what Elon Musk, love him or hate him, <laughs> is so good at. They're changing the world. And that's what we're about to do because the world is already changing. Think about this as an architect or an artist bringing to life these new worlds, these new possibilities, these new integrated solutions, these services, these partnerships that can help us get there, where imagination and curiosity and a little invention or a lot of invention goes a long way. So I want you to think about it this way. Customer experience and business customer experience are incredible differentiators and competitive advantages. So with IIoT and IoT and sensors and edge and mixed reality, we can bring these new worlds to life. We can give machines and processes a voice. But all that takes is you. Of course, there's the iterative parts of all of this. In the novel economy, we still need to iterate forward. We have to improve the things that need improving. But there are also things that need inventing. And so we have to think forward. I call it uh, infinite digital transformation. It's this concept of digital transformation being ongoing, never ending, ceaseless, but also splitting it into human-centered operational innovation and also iteration combined with business model innovation and business model iteration using all of these new technologies and these new capacities. Look, it's not just about enabling new products and services. It's not just about partnerships. These are things we have to do. They have to be split into iteration and innovation, but it's also about how you want to improve how you work, how you think, how you create, so that you are demonstrating or exuding operational excellence at a time where people are still trying to figure out how to survive in the new normal so they can be ready for the next normal. You're already over that. You're shooting for the moon. It's a moonshot. So leaving this real talk, you play a role in how all of this will come to life. Through imagination, through imagineering, you will dis you'll, you'll set the stage, actually, for phase two in the novel economy for thriving in phase three, where business customers and consumers will experience these new immersive worlds, these new incredible business services and products that help everyone thrive together forward. This is your time. Thank you, Brian. I just wanted to check in with some of the comments. We have one here that says Brian Solis is inspiring. And uh, I agree with that one. A comment from Indonesia about more innovation that is needed to win against the competition. And there's a theme on Twitter right now about surviving and thinking about new solutions and operational innovations. So really this theme of surviving, living and thriving. And also a comment from Peru uh, talking a little bit about the future of 5G. So next up, COVID has ushered us into a contact-free economy. We need strategies to adapt to this low-touch environment while enabling customers and allowing customers to experience new experiences. Luckily, we are in a critical period when mass adoption of new XR technologies combined with 5G will provide a huge suite of new tools and possibilities. I spoke earlier with Catherine D. Henry and she addresses some of the more exciting developments in virtual reality and how companies can take advantage of this new medium to better connect, create, communicate, and collaborate. Catherine, you've talked about how this pandemic is a, a catalyst for XR experiences and a contact-free economy. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing out there? 
Right, absolutely. Well, in a contact-free economy, um, basically it means that we're going to eliminate the touch points along the entire value chain of your company's operations. Everything from upstream activities like supply sourcing, man, uh, manufacturing, uh, production, distribution, logistics, to the downstream activities that include customer relations and client interactions. So basically COVID has really forced us, catapulted us into this contact-free economy where automation is going to be fundamental. And so therefore we need to innovate all of those processes under this new scenario. So we need new strategies to address those, to increase efficiencies, reduce costs, overhead and physical interaction. So luckily we're in an era where we can, you know, we can adopt mass scale in this in this in this capacity with 5G because we have a huge suite of new tools and that gives us a lot, a lot of new solutions and possibilities. When we talk about innovation, uh, we've seen a lot of interesting applications of XR out there, uh, especially within entertainment, uh, but perhaps it's still not mainstream. What's it going to take for it to be more common? Well, I think, you know, one of the things, we're really at a tipping point right now for XR. And by XR, it's interesting. A lot of people talk about augmented reality. That was very popular years ago. And so I'm not going to address really the AR applications for manufacturing and facilities maintenance. We already know about that. What's interesting about this is VR. And, and so under the umbrella of XR, we've got virtual augmented reality, but we also have, say, uh, AI, because a lot of things, things enable the other capabilities. But again, looking at specifically the, the verticals within the XR umbrella, AR has really had its moment, but it's been slowed down because of COVID. And so now is the moment, interestingly, where we're seeing VR come to light. And it's really exciting because uh, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, VR as being a, a sort of the stepchild to the AR because it's really been something that's been focusing on the gaming market. But what people aren't really aware of and what I'm really excited to tell you about is that there's a huge non-gaming XR market, specifically in the VR space. And so, you know, we're looking at a market that's already $19 billion, the combined VR and AR market globally, according to Statista, and it's growing at a 48% compounded annualized growth rate, which is pretty impressive. And we're expecting to see that over the next three to four years, thanks to 5G. 5G is going to unleash all of this. So we talk about adoption, um, you know, 2014, Mark Zuckerberg first bought the Oculus Quest for $2.3 billion. He had the vision of making VR the next social platform. And um, he says that, uh, you know, mobile is the platform for today. And now we're getting ready for the platform of tomorrow. So what I really want to convey today is what are the business possibilities? What are the commercial opportunities for you who are watching this program to capitalize on in the shorter term? And what I'm saying is that virtual reality is a very significant space to be in. And so you want to look at new partnerships, build the infrastructure and identify the platforms where you want to be. Because effectively what we're looking at is the next wave of the new spatial internet. And that's super exciting. Everything that we have in the real world today basically can be recreated on a one-to-one -one scale within virtual reality. So, uh, you know, everything from headquarters, I've had people ask me, but one of my clients wants to rebuild their headquarters in VR, um, you know, manufacturing, engineering, a AEC, which is architecture, engineering, and construction, they're already building scale models the same way you would on paper, but not only can they see it in a 3D context, they can then blow it up and actually be in that space. So there are opportunities to, uh, to reduce costs and overhead and also time to market with VR that are already being realized. But looking forward, I know that US Air Force, Walmart, and Accenture have been using VR for training. So looking forward, all these different platforms for education, for medical applications, for, uh, for ed <laughs> education, et cetera, all of these things are being replicated in VR. So that's what we have to think about. It's kind of like the early days of the internet. Do you have a web presence? Do we want to build a web? It was just in 1990s where people started to think about building a web presence. And now here we are in the 2020s thinking about the three-dimensional web and it's a game changer. And that's where the opportunity is. Whatever we're doing in the real world now, we're going to have to replicate 
in the virtual world and e-commerce is already there. We already have people in these spaces and there are multiple platforms in the spaces and I'm happy to tell you more about that. Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. When we talk about the application of this technology and specifically the adoption among consumers and enterprises, uh, what's it going to take in terms of that adoption happening quickly over the months or years to come? Yeah. Okay, so basically, I mean, when we talk about adoption, it's interesting because a lot of people aren't aware that there are already over a hundred different platforms in VR for collaboration and communication, just meeting and conference platforms alone. And we are looking at 3 million different worlds in Rec Room, which is one of the most popular social VR sites. And another social VR site, VR Chat, had 17,000 concurrent users. So the evidence is there that people are already going. We've had major concerts like, like The Weeknd and David Guetta and others are really going onto this, these platforms where we're seeing the Tribeca Film Festival, the Cannes Film Festival, the Venice VR. So we're seeing a migration of mass entertainment, which is drawing people. On the other hand, we're also seeing technology developing so quickly that it's really the perfect moment. And mark my words, 2020 is the tipping point for VR because this is bringing us again into a space where because of COVID, we're able to communicate, collaborate, have meetings in VR, and that's already happening. Again, I talked about Mark Zuckerberg's incredible commitment to this space and how Facebook has done really good work. But looking at other companies like HTC Vive, they've also announced that they've got a collaboration tool in the headset that will allow you to meet up with your colleagues and a suite is already there. You actually just put it on your, on your head and it's already set up. So it's significantly better than Zoom. What I want to talk to is about, you know, 5G is enabling this because we're basically going from a latency of 20 milliseconds today to just one millisecond. That's about the amount of time it takes to snap my fingers or for like a flash on the camera. And so that's a significant difference. And so being able to do this, not just mobile games, but to enable this entire suite of opportunities, whether it's uh, education, training, a showroom, you're going to be able to invite your guests. There will be conferences in VR. All of these things are happening. And Amber, to your point, what's happening to, to evidence that? I think that for the Quest 2, which was just announced last week, and I'm waiting for mine any day now, <laughs> um, it basically enables you to have access to VR for as, as little as $300, and you have an entire suite of, of entertainment and opportunities, artistic opportunities, education. So like early YouTube, there were no demos, there were no tutorials, and then it became this rich environment. So that's what we're looking at. And so I fully expect VR to be a cloud service in the same way that you would see, you know, gaming as a cloud service today, VR content as a cloud service. So network slices that are developed to that, it's a green field right now. Uh, you've touched a little bit on 5G. I would love to talk further about the telecom provider's role uh, in this evolution and adoption of XR. Well, I think the telecoms are rightly, they have to look at their partnerships and they want to they have to look at how they want to be on these platforms, right? So, you know, you've got to create a virtualization strategy in the same way that you have to think about what do we want on our website? And early websites, if you look back, you know, I love reading the, the books by Tim Berners-Lee and, and others and looking at websites designs, they were pretty awful. Yep. What they were was effectively people would take their annual report or their, you know, whatever documents they had, their quarterly reports, and just kind of post them on the web like flat pieces of paper. But the exciting thing about virtual spaces, this 3D internet means that we have to recreate our corporate presences online. And so 5G enables that. It's not just the internet of things that's absolutely fascinating and that's going to unleash a whole range of productivity in the industrial side. But whether it's industry or it's entertainment, everyone's going to have to have a virtual presence. And I can tell you, Amber, I've done a study recently of multiple different brands. I went to Subway is very popular in VR. Disney has at least a dozen different experience in VR. And I can assure you, none of these have been condoned or approved or are they corporate defined. These are all fan sites. So what's interesting is that they already have places and people meet up in these spaces. And so we already have presence in VR, but going forward, you're going to have to determine your virtualization strategy. Do you want to have a 
you know, how do you want to use these platforms? Do you want to have a, a trade show booth? Do you want to be able to receive clients as, as a showroom or a sales office? Do you want to you know, just meet as your corporate executives? Do you want to have an, a quarterly meeting? You know, a long time ago, I remember webcasts were a big thing for quarterly meetings <laughs> with investors. And now it's a completely different thing. With VR, you can access it both by PC. So some 70% of people will access a hyperfair or something else by a PC, but it's obviously much better in VR because you can stand aside and talk to people. So how does 5G uh, take advantage of that? Again, you have to decide what your challenges are and how VR can solve them. Would you like to have a trade booth? So for example, if the Mobile World Congress were to have its next conference as totally virtual, what assets have you got ready? And what would you like to demo? How would you like to receive people? There are meeting spaces in VR. The partnerships, what platforms make sense for you to host the majority of your clients and to handle that bandwidth? So there are a lot of opportunities, as I said, to combine with different partners, either in the industrial, e-commerce, retail. That's another huge one we're seeing e-commerce already um, in Sansar just run a fashion show in VR and people could not only wear the outfits and buy digital outfits, but they could also buy the real outfits and have them sent to their homes. So there are two different streams of retail happening and that's going to happen across the e entire internet for all assets. So it's a real game, but 5G is a game changer and the opportunities for uh, network providers are significant. It's so interesting because uh, clearly partnership is one way for the telecom industry to move XR forward. Are there any other ways uh, that our audience should consider in terms of ensuring that uh, they are able to uh, do the most with this emerging technology? Well, to do the most of the working technologies, I think it's just important to understand how these things work in the different platforms. Because in the same way that you know early apps were developed, people thought, well, I should basically replicate my website onto my app, not understanding that those were very different technologies. So what I would advise is really to understand, and I've seen some major brands establish themselves on the absolute wrong programs, uh, platforms rather, in VR for their brands. So what I'm suggesting is that it's really important to understand before you make an investment, it's like going to the moon, you wanna make sure you've got all the right equipment and you, know, you can actually make it there and back. We wanna make sure that when you actually land and you put the flag down, that this is exactly where you're, the destination you'd like to be and that you're prepared to stay there. So um, I would just suggest that in making the partnerships and planning how you want your, your presence in this new world, to, to work very carefully, not with just traditional UI UX people, but people who really understand the spatial web and what it offers. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about what telecom providers can do in terms of XR experiences to build relationships with their customers? Amber, that's a really great question and I'm glad you asked it because one of the things I've been thinking about was gaming as a cloud service and a lot of the major network providers and, and tech companies are in this space. Amazon just mentioned the Luna program a couple of weeks ago. And so that's a space where people are investing very heavily. But what nobody is really talking about, and this is really interesting, is virtual reality as a service. And I can completely envision that you would have network slices dedicated to different streaming packages where you're allowing some gaming or more gaming, a certain amount of VR film, a certain amount of, you know, there's education in VR, there's exercise in VR, there are conferences in VR, art, art exhibits. So in the same way HTC Vive has created a tranche of different activities. So they have one arts center, one meeting center, one social space, which is VR chat. They have the wave, which is a concert space and they have Engage, which is an education format, and they put that all in one headset. Well, imagine the same thing as a streaming option for VR. So I think there's a rich opportunity commercially to create partnerships with some big names and to offer VR as a service. And there are probably a number of different ways of slicing that, 
But I think that that's something that nobody's really moving on right now. And I think that can be very competitive and very commercially rewarding space. Uh, Catherine, great advice. Thank you so much for joining us today. And, and I look forward to seeing you in a virtual reality experience one day soon. I will take it. I take people on tours all the time, Amber. So please join me. I look forward to it. You can join by PC even if you don't have a headset. I would love that. Thanks so much, Catherine. My pleasure. As smartphones were a must win yesterday, home is the must win today because now we're working from home, educating our children at home, entertaining at home, and even receiving healthcare at home. I interviewed Jess Jefferson Wang, lead author of The Future Home in the 5G Era, to discuss not only how CSPs can leverage new technologies to make the future home work better for us, but also how they need to find the courage to create a right to play and build the differentiation to win. Jefferson, you wrote a book called The Future Home in the 5G Era. Let's dive into a couple of the main concepts in that book. So Amber, I wanted to highlight three key points from the book. The first one is really around the user behavior challenges and changes. The second one is really around new technology like 5G and what are the impacts on the home. And the third one is really around what is the actual vision of the future home. So let's dig into the first one around user behavior changes. So we wanted to put the human at the center, at the heart of the book. So we conducted primary research and we actually finished writing the book well before the global pandemic. What we found is that the trends and the behavioral changes that we actually documented were actually accelerated during COVID. Now, while this was validating, the most important part was really figuring out which ones of these trends would continue on in a post-COVID environment. So when you look at things like working from home more, and the productivity increases that you get and the actual quality of life increases that you get for the people who can work from home, those are scenarios that we see continuing on even after COVID. We find that in an Accenture research that we recently conducted, that 53% of people who had never worked from home before actually want that option going forward. Now, when you look at other experiences that we do at home more than ever, things like virtual doctor's visits at home, so this is actually a pretty big problem. There's millions of people who are immune compromised and who actually don't even have transportation potentially to make it to in-person doctor's visits. So how can we solve that? And even still, what are the advantages of a virtual health visit? So for example, avoiding the commute, actually having time and not waiting around for a doctor, but doing it on your time is actually incredibly beneficial. And when you actually look at this and dig down deeper, we found that from Accenture Research, 41% of Gen Z actually prefers these virtual doctor's visits over the in-person experience. So we're starting to see a trend there change as well. Then you're starting to see situations where digital has caused certain situations that we're trying to fix. So when you look at alone while together with others, this becomes a problem that we could potentially solve. So you're living at home with your family and we've all seen it at the dinner table. No one can put down their smartphones. Everybody's glued to a digital device. And even though we have the opportunity to interact with each other, we don't use that opportunity. So can a future home identify those usage patterns and those situations and find the right moments to create an activity or an event so that we actually put down our devices and we wanna spend time with those interactions in person. And then there's other scenarios where digital can actually solve so for example, together while being alone is another situation when you look at this. So we're very isolated. Some, some people actually don't live with people and right now we can't travel. So can we close that distance? Can we actually create experiences or more frequencies where we connect with our friends and families and our loved ones? Also find new ways to be more immersive in those connections beyond just a simple video call. So we find that you know 49% of people now will and plan to do more virtual connections with their friends and family. And what are the new ways to do that through, through immersive technology? So then we move to the second point around new technology and what are the enablers that it can create? So when you look at a new tech like 5G and edge computing, is that a way that it can harmonize the current situation? So right now it's, it's a really fragmented environment in our world. 
We have Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, you name it. It's all over the place and that creates this fragmentation. A lot of times it can take users up to two and a half hours to install and actually create the passwords and get these devices up and running in the uh, current smart home environment. So does 5G provide an ability to harmonize all this technology? Does 5G provide an opportunity where you can just take the device out of the box, power it on and go, so that you don't need to actually enter in a complex password, find the network, download an app and do all those things? Then the third key point is when it comes to the actual future home vision, the actual core thesis that we have is making you feel at home anywhere. And this concept is really about hyper-personalization. It's about getting the actual data so that it's not in silos and it's allowed to be used to benefit you in a complete manner. So this sounds easy, but it's actually incredibly hard to do. When you look at all the devices you have in your home today, some are shared, like the actual TV, like the thermostat, like the smart speaker. Some of these devices are very individual, like your smartphone or your watch. And each of these has different devices, different operating systems, different applications, and different silos of data. And it's difficult to break all these down uh, to create that at home anywhere environment. This is where we see the communication service providers actually have a pretty good opportunity here. And it's a moment in time where they can be the orchestrator and give the freedom back to the actual users. So being that orchestrator to be able to actually break down those data silos, being the orchestrator to create the business model so that everybody's incented to do that, and then finding a way to make this all work together for the actual user is an incredible benefit that we see and an opportunity we see. And it's a way to make everybody feel at home anywhere, whether it's uh, around four walls or even on four wheels. I was counting in my home the other day, I think I have approximately 25 connected devices. Uh, many people call those smart devices. Some of them may not be all that smart. So let's dig into that term in terms of a smart device. What is it that makes one of these devices smart? Yeah, Amber, I bet that that 25 number is going to increase for you and everyone else in the near future for sure. You know, I'm glad you used the word connected devices because that's a big difference in what we're talking about right now. And you mentioned what makes a device smart. You know, when you look at just basic connectivity, when you look at some form of compute power and you look at some data storage, that can create a capability or a potential to be smart, but is it really smart? Does it warrant that word smart? So when you look at these situations, there's levels of smart. And in the book, we talk about uh, these levels of smart. So you have devices that are more request-based today. And every time I wake up in the morning, I still have to ask the smart speaker, what's the weather like? You know, and that's a very much request-based situation. There's devices that are, are strongly correlated but aren't working together. So when you think about uh, weight as an indicator, the amount of sleep that you get, what you're eating, and ultimately how much uh, your fitness regime is working towards this. Those are all strongly correlated, but I bet that you have different devices and different applications and different services on each of those so that they're not all working together correctly to make your life better. And then finally, you look at things that are automated but not really intelligent. So when I'm not feeling well, I couldn't make it into work and I'm still in bed, why does my vacuum have to go off at 7 a.m. without any regard for the situation? So again, a situation of where it's simply just automated and while that does save me time and save all of us time, it's not really intelligent. It didn't figure out that last night I took my temperature and I was running a fever. In the middle of the night, I had to get up and actually change the thermostat more than the normal settings uh, because I was getting chills and I was still in bed at my normal normal time when I'm supposed to get up. As a result, when you add those up, vacuum cleaner, you don't need to go run at 7 a.m. You know, take a day off. So I think those are things that we have to actually understand that these aren't necessarily smart devices yet. They have the potential to be, but right now they're simply just connected devices and we need to get them to intelligence. What about the decision-making process in the home? Because when we talk about smart devices, now, like you've said, we are assuming that the human is making a lot of the decisions. What about the machines? What is the role of the machine in that context? You know, Amber, it's a really good point that a decision is just a conclusion reached after consideration. So you need the past decisions, you need the current context, in order to anticipate the future needs of those future decisions. 
So you need compute power, you need connectivity, you need the data. But right now, you can't really have a natural experience because a lot of those are all separated right now. It's separate data pools uh, and different silos. So we have to find a way to break all those down. We have to put the right business context in place in order to incent everybody to work together. And we need an orchestrator to be able to get everybody working towards a common goal, which is improving the user experience in the home. How optimistic are you that that can happen? Yeah, Amber, so I really think about this like a team sport. You need the connectivity providers, the communication service providers to work with the device manufacturers, to work with the cloud providers who are gonna work with the application developers. And really when you think about this, you know, it is possible if there is an orchestrator, that word uh, that we talked about before, and an orchestrator as a team captain who can attract the best players to their team, who can get the most out of each player, uh, get them all working towards a common goal. You know, that's really the opportunity in front of us right now. And I think that's the really key role that, that we need is that orchestration role. Let's pick up on that in terms of the role of the CSP. How, how do you see that role evolving when it comes to the smart home? You know, many CSPs have tried smart home in the past with limited success. I think it's important to highlight there's some differences now, though. When, when you look at kind of the, the past, there was fragmented technology like we talked about. There was Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, and all those things. And in the future, can 5G harmonize those is a big difference. Um, also in the past, you had users uh, who have to be, Amber, you and I talked about this, the users had to be the CTO of their homes or solution architects of their own homes. And then that's a hard job. You have to set up the connectivity and make sure there's no dead zones in the house. You have to actually read the labels of all these devices and make sure it fits in your ecosystem before you buy it and download the app, enter in the password and install it. You have to actually troubleshoot and diagnose issues if something goes wrong. And being the CTO of your own home is really difficult, uh, let alone if you're trying to do this remotely for your, your mom or your aging parents, you, you wanna throw yourself off a cliff. But in the future, can the CSPs actually help orchestrate this? Um, you know, also the, in the past, there was really no ecosystem business model. Uh, but in the future, can the CSPs create more of a sharing business model so that everybody wants to contribute, everybody gets incented to contribute, and we're all aligned towards building that common goal? Um, the other thing is, you know, CSPs really didn't have software development capabilities previously. And now that's changing. Software development is incredibly important. I think CSPs are seeing that and starting to hire and retain uh, more software development capabilities. Uh, and this is important to get into more of a test and iterate culture, uh, which has got to change for this to be successful. You know, we wrote the book, uh, 5G Future Home, in order to stimulate these conversations with the CSP, uh, you know, as a key focal point of this. And I think that I believe that communication service providers have this opportunity or this right to play in the future version of the home. And if you really look at the book as starting the stimulation and starting the discussion points, I hope that people read it and see that there is a roadmap that's laid out. And specifically in chapters six, seven, and eight, it lays out the blueprint of the business model, the value chain position, and, and hopefully gives the CSPs the courage uh, to actually try again into the home environment. So when you ask the question of what's the role of the CSPs, let, let's start at almost like the, the strength right now, which is trust. When you look at what's happened, CSPs have gained and built an incredible amount of trust over the past year. So number one, they've you know waived data caps, they've waived uh, overage fees, and they have basically kept us connected at the most critical times. Uh, and, and certainly when you look at this trust, Accenture found that 62% of consumers now trust CSPs with their data security. And that's a huge advantage right now that you can capitalize on. But what's also important to think about on the flip side is that trust is very perishable, just like this opportunity in the future home for CSPs, that it takes a long time to build up this trust, but only a moment to lose it. Uh, so that's just like this opportunity when you think about it. So if you dive into trust as a point to capitalize on, and you think through what is the actual control points that CSPs can actually build together and drive into this right to play, 
the SIM and the eSIM is an incredible opportunity. The connectivity like we talked about from fixed to mobile and the seamlessness of that, the ability to have customer premise equipment like the modem as a control point, uh, the billing relationship and the customer care and the service is gonna be incredibly important. And, and one real differentiator that I think a lot of folks miss is the industry convergence between uh, the CSPs as well as utilities or regional health providers. This is a really differentiated point uh, that can come through for the, the future home use cases like we talked about. So after you get past the control points, you really look at where the value chain position is for CSPs and that really dictates the right to win. So the right to play we talked about uh, and what's the role of a CSP, but what's the right to win? So if you look at 3G, CSPs tried first party services. In a 4G world, it was relegated a little bit more of a pipe position, but in the 5G world and in future homes specifically, can CSPs move into that platform, into that orchestrator position to try and have the right to win? Can you talk more about platform and, and define that term as you're using it now? Yeah, so when we talk about the word platform, we generally describe it as a multi-sided platform. And when you think about that, there is you know one side where it's all of the different solution providers, developers, um, and, and then the other side of it is really the, the customers you have today and the customers you want tomorrow. And the position of a platform provider is really number one to, to certainly connect all of the solution providers and developers to the right customers and, and making sure that they're relevant and connected easily um, so that everybody can enjoy the services and the benefits um, as a platform provider. But then there are certain roles as a platform provider, as a CSP can actually provide specifically to each side. So, you know, when you think about the developer side, extending things like your business services, um, if, if there is a smaller developer or a smaller solution provider that just wants to focus on the product but doesn't really want to build out a billing system or, or deal with customer care, can you extend your CSP billing system or AI powered chatbot? over to them so that they can continue to focus on their product that they're you're now connecting to new customers. Um, there's other things on, on the network side, you know, can you expose certain APIs to actually improve their current products or their offerings? And what type of analytics and security can you provide to the, the developers so that they can actually, again, continue to enhance their products? And then there's a responsibility to the customer side, certainly as well. You know, number one, what are potentially professional services you can provide or different flexibility options you could provide for, you know, do it yourself install, do it for me install, or even do it with me install. So how do you actually provide those different flexibility options for different levels of skill sets for your customers? How do you think about um, what types of security for physical and digital you can provide to the customers uh, so that they can feel safe? So I think when you look at a platform position, certainly one is to connect the actual solution providers to the actual customers, uh, but also serving each one uh, differently so that you can actually all be successful. I'd love to end on that potential because one of the exciting parts of this conversation really is what the future home looks like. Walk us through a day in the life of the future home and the possibilities that exist. Yeah, you know, when we talk about the future home, uh, like we said at the very beginning, that a lot of it is basically putting the person at the center of the story. And when you think about what this could actually become and realize, it's really exciting. You know, let's do a day in the life as an example, and this is one of the descriptions in the book, uh, along with several different use cases. But, you know, number one, you, you wake up and you look out the window and because there is both kind of sun and clouds, you know, it toasts up the weather. Um, the, the home itself has looked into your counter. It understands kind of where you're going to be throughout the day, what activities you're going to do. And it realizes that in those locations, the weather may not be directly uh, predictable. So it toasts up the weather for you. You know, when you when you walk into the bathroom to brush your teeth, you know, certainly the scale uh, and, and I've got some vacation coming up on the weekend and the scale realizes that I'm ahead of my weight loss goals for for the vacation on the weekend. So when I get to the kitchen, um, I am able to get the uh, sweetened creamer for my coffee uh, without any type of guilt. Um, when you actually move to my, my regular commute and normally I take a bus and all of a sudden that bus for some reason is late 
and I have to go into a completely new environment. I've never taken the subway before, but now since uh, the home is now following me and I'm making me feel at home anywhere, I'm not simply just given an opportunity to go to the subway, but I'm guided through it with augmented reality. I know where the actual station and the platform and when is the train gonna get there. I know when to get off and, and almost more importantly in this new environment, when I get off, I know which exit to take that's closest to my destination. And then even further, when, when you're, we talked a lot about alone together and together alone, you know, situations where we're still very isolated, we need that human connection. You know, what are the more immersive ways to do that? So I, I live halfway across the country from my mother. Uh, and instead of just doing a video chat FaceTime, you know, in the future home experiences, can we actually both take a virtual walk down the street that, that we grew up on uh, in the old environment and, and how it looked when we did grow up on it? And does that give us the opportunity to connect and reminisce and, and really remember the memories and also have a deeper connection uh, to talk about? So those are some of the exciting use cases uh, in the future home. And you're going to need all of the uh, ecosystem players led by an orchestrator like the CSPs um, with new technology like 5G and edge compute and eSIM and AI and ML um, to be able to realize those things. So that's the really exciting part. How excited are you about the future home? Amber, I'm incredibly excited. It's a huge opportunity when you really look at all the people spending more time in their homes, creating much more data. It really is an important opportunity. And many people see that. You, you see a lot of different players working on expanding their position in the value chain or changing the actual value chains themselves. Uh, so it is becoming a very, very dynamic uh, situation. And if you really think about if mobile was the must win of yesterday, then home is the must win of today. Thank you so much, Jefferson. Thank you so much, Amber. All right, so before we wrap up this session, I did want to check in with some of your comments that are coming in. There are so many, so keep it coming. First up, Tony asked the question about using VR to create positive impact on climate by reducing the need to be physically present everywhere. Really good point, Tony. Benedict is thinking along the lines of using 5G and VR to help with medical procedures. I'm reading a lot about this as well. It seems that everyone is really excited about virtual reality and partnership with brands and wondering how brands can do this. Uh, I think uh, Catherine's concept of VR as a service uh, will probably be the answer. Uh, everybody loving the discussion about smart homes, maybe not being so smart right now and a lot of room for an improvement and how Jefferson said it's more of a team sport. Uh, comment about the CSP ecosystem models becoming more the norm and the test and iterate culture. Uh, again, uh, a lot of people just really excited about the future of XR and the future of the smart home. So great discussions going on. Please keep them coming. We have another session. This concludes the second of our three sessions today, but please join us again at 6 p.m. GMT for our final session. And remember, keep those comments coming. Thanks so much for being here and we'll see you soon.